This is Carl King, and here I am with a podcast that doesn't seem to have a name. And I'm at Dave Elich's place. Yeah, what's that's, up? That's Dave Elich right there. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Dave has played with some musical groups. Uh huh. <laughs> you want to name some of those? Well, I guess it's easy to go backwards. Uh, I've been playing with Miley Cyrus lately, and then I have a new band with um, Greg Pucciato from the Dillinger Escape Plan, Max Cavalera from Soulfly and Sepultura, and Troy Sanders from Mastodon, and that band's called Killer Be Killed. I just finished doing that record. Pretty excited about that. Uh, M83, the Mars Volta, a lot of people know me from doing that. Uh, my old band Daughters of Mara. I've done stuff with Juliet Lewis and Justin Timberlake and really all over the place. <clears throat> Little Neil Hamburger there. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I love me some Neil Hamburger. It's been said that you are the Richie Sambora of drums. <laughs> Who said that? I'm saying that. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that. I feel like I, I feel like I should start wearing a headband or, or leather pants or something. But I'm also sort of the uh, Warren Buffett of <laughs> fans of drummers. <laughs> I wish I was the Warren Buffett of anything. That guy's the shit. Yeah, the way that I see it, I I, I think that you are undervalued as a drummer. Uh, you haven't really gotten your recognition yet. But I think you're a total monster. And thank you. And. That's where the Warren Buffett part comes in, <laughs> because I'm buying into Dave Elitch right now while the stock is undervalued. Uh, you know, and you're the Richie Sambora, because in guitar magazines, I used to always read these interviews with guys who would say, man, they would hear this killer playing backstage somewhere, and they would go back and they'd see who it was, and it was Richie Sambora shredding it up. <laughs> right, but right. he would never... Like, you'd never hear that right. coming across. Right. So nobody knew what Richie Sambora was really, right. as far as a guitarist goes. Right. And I think that's kind of where you're at right now with the drumming. A lot of people hear you playing within musical contexts at, in gigs and things, mm -hmm. but they might not be familiar with what you can actually do. Sure. And I like that. I mean, I think that i mean you know if someone wants to hear me like you know sh shred or whatever you know like they can obviously go on youtube and you know there's clips of me playing with the mars volta the drum cam clip which a lot of people have seen um and you know things i've done for my companies like Vic firth and remo and some there's lots of videos you can see me doing that on but a lot of the gigs i've played are, are pop music you know so i'm not going to sit there and and you know just jizz all over the gig you know what i mean it's like that's not why they hired me they hired me to do a service and i'm doing a service and you know it was funny when i did uh when i did the tv shows the with like when i did fallon and ellen with miley mm -hmm. i didn't tell anybody i was doing it i was just like i'm just gonna do this and you know see what happens so i you know i did it and you know that song wrecking ball is a, a, a power ballad you know so like and i'm not even playing in the verses you know? so like Besides, like, some tambourine and stuff like that. It was so funny how many people hit me up, like, on text or emails or whatever. And some of these people I, like, you know, really respect. And they were like, man, I can't, like, you sounded great. Like, I can't believe, like, the restraint you had and, like, how you just, like, didn't, like, blow all over the tune. And I'm like, do you think I'm retarded? You know what I mean? This is on, <laughs> this is on national TV. Like, I'm playing a, a ballad. Like, are you kidding me? The fact that you're like even saying this right now is just crazy to me that you just don't get it, you know? So it's so funny to me. Like, I don't know, maybe just, maybe that's really hard for some people to just lay back. But, you know, when I'm, when someone hires me, like I take myself completely out of the equation. They're hiring me to, to, to get the fuck out of the way and just, you know, make everything feel good, make everything gel. It has nothing to do with me, you know? So like, most of the time, even in the Mars Volta, like, Omar would have to look back at me and go, like, more, 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 more. Because, like, that's just the way I see things. I'm just going to, like, if you want me to play a bunch of shit, I can. But I'm not going to come out of the gate doing that because you're just going to ruin the music most of the time. You know? And you talk about that in um, your clinics and things like yeah. that. You, I heard you saying something recently about... What was it? You were saying your job is to make other people feel good and dance or, yeah, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like, 
like you know m83 like that band's like a french synth pop band you know and that their single midnight city like that 90 percent of that song i'm playing on a yamaha dtx like pad to my left you know and a kd7 like pedal like electronic trigger for my bass drum so that was like their big hit and it's a great song but like it's just mm, doof, 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 doof. it's just all electronics until Ian the sax player came out and then I'd turn around and play the kit and we'd kind of jam it out sax solo vibes there was like I'm not gonna say, and that band is just mostly like four on the four like mm, ah, mm, ah. I'm not gonna sit there and blow all over that stuff like because you also have to take into consideration like who you're playing with and what they're used to hearing and like you don't ever want to have someone turn around and like give you that look like like what the fuck was that you know what I mean I just want to make, like I don't have anything to to prove you know what I mean like especially on those gigs like that's you have to you have to consider like what your role is and what you're being called for and for that stuff it's everybody just like just having a good time and just dancing and if you throw in some crazy weird odd stuff people are just like whoa it's like a record skipping, you know? Whereas, like, I could do that stuff in the Mars Volta, and it, it, it works, because that's that's the scenario that, that you do that stuff in, you know? Which mm-hmm. is great about that gig. But still, even with that gig, like, I just tried to play John Theodore's parts, like, exactly right, like, note for note. And then when I had a drum solo, I'd go crazy. At this point, you know, I don't have anything to, to prove, you know? That's a mature place to be in. You know, I spend all my time thinking about this stuff, so I don't know. It, it, it I may, maybe it's like a recent sort of revelation, maybe in the past six months or something. But when I was, I was just doing a bunch of stuff with Miley in, in Europe, and uh, and I just did this Kiss Jingle Ball thing with her, and everything was great. And in between the two things, I did a two week, twelve day clinic tour all over Italy. Um, which was a ton of fun. I did it with my buddy Federico Palovich, who's a killer, killer drummer. Actually, he has a band called Death Strange. You probably really dig them. They're crazy. Okay. Yeah, crazy, tacky Italian metal shit. They're nuts. <clears throat> so he's a good buddy of mine. So we just did this clinic tour. And after we got done, he did a clinic tour with Chris Coleman like a year ago. Put the whole thing together yeah. and drove around. You huh. know you know Chris. Yeah. Chris is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Chris is like, you know, you go see that dude, It's like, uh, it's like a robot. Like, it's like, perfection like he's a freak yeah and uh, with clinics a lot of times that's how they're kind of presented like you go up there and, and you like do your thing and it's supposed to be perfect and it's like under a microscope and you know i started doing these clinics and then i was just like you have to take every every situation for what it is like i came from 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 doing this Miley stuff where like we did an unplugged video for BBC one radio in London and it got three and a half million views in 12 hours, you know? So like you're coming from that to doing a clinic tour and you have to take it for what it is and be like, you know what? Like this is me like playing my own original music, like by myself. I'm just going to go for shit. And if it doesn't happen, like who cares? I'm just yeah. going to go for broke, and if I miss it and fuck, some, some, fuck something up, like, it's just me and these 50 people. Who cares? You know, maybe there's someone filming it that, that'll post it on YouTube, which is a bummer. But, like, <laughs> you know, but it's like, it's just us sharing this moment. And if I goof something, yeah, I was going for something new, and I didn't quite pull it off. But a lot, it's just a, it's just a different way of presenting yourself that's a lot more honest. And it was also just because I was just like, I just got tired of that because we're humans that we're not perfect. And, and every time I would sit there and be like, Oh, I got this one tiny thing wrong. It's just like, it's just not real, Mm. you know? And, and so like people would be like, well, what do you, I got this question a lot. Like, well, what are you practicing now? And I'm like, well, I'm trying to keep my left foot going on quarter notes and being able to play everything I play normally, (laughs) you know, like just, which is really hard. And I'm trying to be as deliberate as possible with my playings with trying to play exactly what I'm thinking in my head instead of just going on autopilot and blowing. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, so this is what that sounds like. And I just try and do both of those things at the same time. And I just be fucking up all over the place. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like this is what it sounds like when I'm practicing. Like you're supposed to be screwing up and you're supposed to sound bad. And I'm just kind of sitting here with you guys watching me just trying to figure stuff out, you know, and it's you kind of tear down that wall of like between you and the and the audience and i mm-hmm. think people really appreciate that but i just got so tired of this like whole like 
thi- this whole thing with like clinics just being like, oh, here's this guy who's going to come up and play like perfectly. And some people are like that. But I just got to a point my whole life I've tried to be like that. And I just got to a point where I'm just like, why? Like, you know, like you see someone like, uh, you know, like like Gary Husband or something playing with Alan Holdsworth, mm-hmm. you know. I saw him play with the big. Me and Ron went to. Me and Bruner went to see him play at the Big Potato years ago, and I've never seen someone just going for something and then he'd fucking nail it, and then four bars later he'd just fall flat on his fucking face, <laughs> and it was just like it was like oh damn. Yeah. But I really appreciate that, you know, because he's really going for it and he's taking risks yeah. rather than someone just playing safe and playing stuff they know and mm-hmm. you know. So I don't know. I kind of just went off on a huge tangent there, but. What was your what was, it, what was it, your original question? What is it about you know the guy who lives in Oklahoma somewhere who is a drummer in his basement or right, something? Right. But he's pissed off at you for getting a job. Right. Right. Well, you don't have to be in Oklahoma to do that, but there's definitely a whole a whole army of trolls on the internet. And I first experienced that with when I got the Mars Volta gig obviously. I try to really just not pay attention to any of that stuff, but we were talking about this earlier. Every every once in a while, you know, I'll see, I'll come across something, and someone's like, just saying some real like rude, mostly ignorant shit. And so every once in a while, I'll be, I'll just call them out, and I'll send them a message and be like, "Hey, dude, just you know, just so you know, like I'm a real human being, and I'm a person, yeah, and I'm an artist, and we all have egos and feelings." <laughs> And, you know, I'm not like some mystical unicorn somewhere. It's like I'm a real person, you know, Mm -hmm. and I see this shit. I saw what you just said. And I'm just letting you know that, that, you know, people people pay attention, you know. And, you know, most of the time people either take down their comments or or they're like, oh, man, uh, you know. And most of the time it's just that. They live in, you know... Who knows? The bumfuck nowhere in their mom's basement, and they're just sitting in there on their couch smoking weed and playing video games, and like, man, I could be doing this, or I'm like, whoa, you know. And it's it's a lot easier to just sit there and and just say whatever you want on the internet and be an armchair quarterback. But now, you know, these days, that's just part of the whole thing, you know. And like, it, it, I just don't pay attention to that shit because what's the point? Why am mm-hmm. I going to listen to some random person who has no experience? It really. Yeah. That's why they're Well, they saying, don't know the actual details. All they know is a little log line yeah. of drumming for Miley Cyrus. Yeah. And then... Yeah. They have no... Or anything. You know, they have no idea about anything. They don't know what it's like to do this for a living because they don't. That's the thing with most, the, most of these people. Yeah. All, all these people are like, blah, 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 or whatever they want to say. And it's like... Cool. What do you do for a living? You work in FedEx or Home Depot or something? Like you don't do this for a living. Yeah. So that's a huge part of it. You know, like you can say whatever you want, but like try and actually do not just being a drummer or playing music, but try and do art for a living full on. Once yeah. you actually do that, then we can have a conversation. You know, because in this day and age, that's not easy. You know. Yeah. Generally, I just completely ignore that shit. Just like all the old Pantera lyrics, you know, like, fuck these, like that Live 101 Proof record, you know, Phil and Salmos. Oh, dude, you ever get that record? The Live no. 101 Proof record? I don't remember it. Oh, dude, Phil and Salmos just like, you know, out of his gourd, but yeah. just like, yeah, fuck all these critics and like, you know, you know, and it's like, even people who are supposed critics who are educated, quote unquote, and know what they're talking about, quote unquote, <laughs> even those people can go fuck off. Like, you know, because like, what are they doing? They're just sitting there critiquing everybody. Like, what are you putting out into the world? Yeah. What are you contributing? Yeah. Nothing. You know, like I've been thinking about doing like, why doesn't someone, I'm sure it exists now, but why doesn't someone just have a site where they're, they only like a critic but they only go only share awesome shit it's never like negative stuff why doesn't someone do that (laughs) yeah you know what i mean like hey this record's fucking awesome check this out oh man i just saw this movie this is killer it's only good stuff yeah you know what i mean because it's like if you don't like something i don't want to hear even if i think it's bad too i don't want to hear about it because i already know it's bad (laughs) <laughs> I don't need to hear you tell me how you also think it's bad. Yeah. But yeah, so I just don't pay attention to that stuff because you have to question the validity of the source. And most of the time, it's some 13-year-old kid in Iowa. 
every once in a while I'll just do it, just, just poke someone just for fun. Yeah. So they go, oh, oh okay. And they kind of get what's, <laughs> you know, get it. But, you know. I remember um, being in a music store when I was a lot younger, right back in Florida, and there was this huge banner of um, uh, Kenny Arnoff uh-huh. on the wall, and he had his Smashing Pumpkins outfit on, <laughs> yeah, you know, huge glasses. like what he wore during that time. Uh-huh. Who, did, who else did he play for? Like John Cougar Mellencamp or something? He's or played for a lot of people. He's Bruce, been in, Bruce Springsteen uh, or something. Yeah, anyway, yeah, he was like that bald-headed bashing guy yeah, in the yeah. MTV videos. Yep. And then he joined Smashing Pumpkins. Yep. And everybody gave him shit about that. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, it, But it, it's funny to me now to think all these years later. And I remember this kid was in the music store. He was working there and he was practicing his... <laughs> chops on the little pad right, right. while he's working right, you know, he right, had to sit there and did a little little little, little. Right, of course and uh he just said i can't believe that guy got that gig he fucking sucks i could do so much better right. than right of course and that's then, exactly what i'm talking about yeah and then it's so funny to years later actually be in a room with kenny arnoff and actually you're right in front like where, where i was at the mm-hmm. big drum bonanza i'm just, they're shooting video right over his shoulder mm-hmm. behind his kit and mm-hmm absorbing that experience of mm-hmm. like this guy has been doing this so long knows what he's talking about yep but i'm sure within the first five minutes you're like oh yeah oh, i get it yeah kenny's cool as shit yeah like i love kenny as a dude he's he was a super cool. philosophical uh-huh but he's, but he's just like who do i want to go have a beer with yeah kenny you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah. whenever i see that dude at the big drum bonanza or at nam or even though nam's a complete shit show but whenever I run into that dude, I'm genuinely like, yes, because he's awesome. Who do you want to have on a tour bus? Kenny. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what we were talking about earlier, man. Like, that's a huge part of this industry. Your playing is a v- small part of it. Having Being the type of person that, like, people want to have on a tour bus or want to mm-hmm. hang out with is huge. Yeah. Like, the hang aspect is huge. Well, because when you're on a tour, you're also just sitting around all day long. Twenty three, twenty three hours a day, man. Yeah. Twenty two and a half, whatever. You're just yeah. sitting around, hurry up and wait. Yeah, you know. So it's a huge part of it, you know. And and Kenny's like genuinely a cool dude. It's not like some act he puts on. Like yeah, because people will see right through that too. Yeah. Um, but he's a great dude, you know. Kenny's a great guy. So. It makes sense. He seems to be busy working a lot. Yeah, he's been working solid since whatever, the 70s or something. I don't know. (laughs) You know, like, I mean, all that Mellencamp shit was like early 80s. So, yeah, he's a a great dude. That's a a huge, that's a huge, huge point right there. It's like, and that kid obviously doesn't get it. It's not about playing. Jimmy Chamberlain and Kenny Aronoff couldn't be more different as players. Mm. Yeah. But, but Billy Corgan was like, who's like one of the top session drummer hired gun dudes in the world yeah all i have to do is tell him to be there uh and everything gets done and that's another reason why (laughs) why kenny's so successful is because he shows up on time yeah he writes charts he's very organized like you never have to worry about him and he's quick you know yeah it has has almost i don't want to say nothing to do with playing but it's that was a huge lesson i had to learn yeah and you know and as a band leader or as a business owner or something you don't want to fuck around anymore like you have so much shit yeah. That you're responsible for. Yep. You want to plug somebody in the seat that's going to actually yep. do the do, right thing. Do their job. Yeah. And- well, that's a huge thing about being like a, like, and this is something else I think about a, a lot is the skill set that you have to have to be like a mercenary. Like, you know, like, like, <laughs> like, like, I'm serious because that's what I am. I'm a fucking mercenary. You're a hired gun. Yeah. You know, it's like the wild, wild west, you know, <laughs> like the, the skill set that you have to have to be able to do what I do or what Kenny does or or, you know, a lot of these other dudes um, do where where you go, hey, nice to meet you. Let's play through this music at once and then let's go on tour or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, the skill set that you have to have to do that is so much larger than like just a band dude. Yeah. Someone who plays in a band and like got really lucky and they just play their own original music. They never have to learn anybody else's shit mm-hmm. and they just play that. And that's what they do their whole life, and they're just really lucky. And it's, you know, it, it, it's just it's 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 unbelievable, like how much more work it takes to be able to do like a higher gun thing than someone who's like quote unquote just in a band. And I'm not saying being just in a band is easy. That's hard because you mm-hmm. you're in a relationship with three or four other people. Yeah, that's like being married oh, three wow. or four times. I had never considered that, but that's 
That's huge. Pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, you know, and, 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 you know, bands that have been around for a long time, I give those guys so much respect because it's like just the fact that you guys could be in a room together still is, is amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like just being in a band with someone for three or four years, let alone 30 or 40, you know, like after, after a few years, you're like, yeah, I've pretty much heard everything that you have to say about ev- anything. Yeah. And then people wonder why Van Halen doesn't ride together on the bus exactly. or whatever. They fly in different planes. Exactly. Or- and it's just like the fact that they're able to, to keep their shit together for that long or whoever you're talking about, you two, the Rolling Stones, like yeah. whoever you're talking about, like that is incredible to me. Um, incredible so it's just a different set of circumstances but i'm talking about like the things that you have to be able to do and most of that is as simple as just doing your homework you know like putting a ton of work in on your own so you come in and you're like i know this shit better than you do you know that's that's the main difference coming in prepared and just knowing the shit you know Mm -hmm. that's that's huge I've been around you a few times of you know friends on facebook been to a few events sure You've got some hobby. Like I see that there's depth to you. You've got hobbies. You you like uh, like old cars and uh-huh. stuff, right? I mean, uh-huh. how would you? What is that called? Old cars? Just in yeah, general, just cars. muscle cars yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You like that stuff? Yeah, classic cars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's other people that I've been around out here in LA that they just be they seem to be totally obsessed with their career success and they don't have any other interests or hobbies. Right. You have interest in reading. Yeah. philosophy uh-huh. and that's another point is you're interested in why things happen instead of how how do i get from a to b sure you're, you're like well let's think about why would you why would you want to do that sure absolutely what is it about this place and maybe that's it's only my experience but why have i run into so many people that are devoid of philosophical thought <laughs> and they're only interested in practical like i need to meet that person so i can get from there to there that's well i think as far as the philosophical thing goes i mean you'll send me random links on facebook like hey i found this crazy article about something or other and send it to me right yeah read this and let me know what you think but that's why i send the shit to you because there aren't very many people that are like oh Cool. Like I can th- that that are hip to that stuff and go. Oh, I get what the scope and the ramifications are here. Yeah. You know, like like you, my buddy Chris Waldrip, who has that band, The Great Wall. The, hmm. I use some of that stuff at the clinics. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. I got to give you that that record. Um, my buddy Michael Iveson, who's great drummer, he plays for that dude Gautier. You know, there's like several people. You know, where I'm where I you know, my dad. It's like several people where I'll send that kind of shit to them because they'll actually get it, you know? Yeah. But, um, I mean, dude, a lot of times when I'm, like, having coffee with someone or catching up or whatever, I'm like, what have you been reading lately? And most people are like, uh, like, just people don't read books anymore. Yeah. It's crazy. And, like, even iPad stuff, like, people don't even do that as much. Yeah. So, I think... But, I mean, I walked in here in your place, and the first two things I saw was way too many drums, <laughs> stacks of drums to the ceiling everywhere yep. in the living room, yep. and then stacks of books. Yeah, I know. I, I know. I have a Which l- I'm not complaining. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's pretty amazing, but I, I hardly ever go to somebody's house and see stacks of books. Yeah, I, well, because every time I read an article about something or I have a friend tell me about something, or I'll just hop on Amazon and buy the book. Yeah. Uh, and so I have quite the backlog of things I need to get to. I think a lot. I don't know, man. I think a lot of that has to do with uh, my dad and the way he kind of raised me and approaches everything. And as far as the car thing goes, that was my first thing I was into because my dad collects cars. Okay. So my dad's extremely knowledgeable about all different eras and and manufacturers and all different aspects of of, of cars. Um, so, you know, down to people who were coach builders, you know, people who people who styled the cars, hmm. like people who raced the cars, like 
people who are executives in certain uh, car companies. I like guess really his his depth of knowledge is pretty unbelievable. Yeah, he writes articles for different 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 things, and but it's a, a hobby for him. You know, mm-hmm. it's not he doesn't make his living out of it. You know, from when I was super young, you know, it would be like we'd be driving around and be like, oh, there's a '55, you know, Chrysler Imperial, or or there's a Alfa Romeo GTV, or like you know, there's a Studebaker mm-hmm. Golden Hawk, or like. So I was kind of like conditioned, like really young, to be like, "Oh, there's that, or there's that, or what's that?" Or I think my dad had like 35 cars at one point. <laughs> I think he's down to about 20 now, wow. 25 maybe. I don't know. I lost track. My drum collection is is uh, very uh, derivative of of that, in meaning that that my dad's collection is extremely eclectic. You mm-hmm. know, um, he has everything from like a 1959 Fossil Vega. HK500, which is a really obscure, rare car. Um, it's a French-bodied car, hmm. but the drivetrain is from a you know a, a Chrysler. It's like a 383 with a 727 transmission. So it's like the same engine and, and transmission that would be in my 70 Barracuda hmm. that I have. So it's a really okay. inter- interesting car. You know, 60s, 70s, 50s. But I mean, you're that way with snare drums, too. Yeah, that's exactly what like I'm saying. Like I see constantly on Facebook, you, here's another snare drum <laughs> that's... Uh, <laughs> painted some certain yeah. way and made out of something yeah, that you were able the, to get somewhere that's the way I that's why I'm like that yeah. because I took all of that that uh, that approach not only being like does this thing sound good but like where was this made why was this made like this the care and the design that goes into into it the history of the company mm-hmm. like all of that stuff like plays into it to to me it's a very indicative of the way that my dad collects cars so you know, and my dad like is a voracious reader, um, so I think a lot of that stuff have to has to do with with him. But I wasn't always like that. I remember him constantly saying when I was a teenager, like, "Don't you want to read? Like, what are you <laughs> reading right now? Like, don't you like love the act of learning? And like, don't you yeah. even enjoy learning?" And I'm just like, "Nah, I'm just gonna go play play drums or whatever." You know, so I definitely haven't always been like this. It's been in the last several several years. But I think that's part of being an artist is trying to understand life. Not necessarily why we're here, but what the fuck are we doing here? You know, and, and that's the lens that you look through. So no matter what you're doing, whether you're you're playing an instrument or you're a painter or you're a graphic design person or, or you're doing in- weird installations, like whatever you're doing, you're basically just trying to make sense of what all of this is. Douglas Coupland wrote that famous book generation x hmm. he's written a bunch of stuff um life without god or life at life after god i thought was really great hmm. and there was this quote i came across i'm like scrolling through my instagram just <laughs> to try and find it i mean you're interested in quotes this is just so unusual you know actually the one of the first times i can remember it happening is uh, there's an artist named andy goldsworthy yeah. Yeah, it was that Is that the guy who does the weird bird houses? And- Rivers and Tides is the documentary. He does shit okay. with, like, ice and stone, and it's... Yeah, he's done some stuff with, like, sticks and kind of looks like bird houses. Okay. Have you seen that documentary, no, Rivers no, and Tides? No. It's on... It should be still on Netflix. You got to check it out. It's incredible. It's old now. But um, I, uh, I saw that, and that dude was just dropping bombs, like left and right and i kept pausing it and and going like fuck i gotta write this down i've seen that like six or seven times seen a bunch of times that was one of the first times where i was like no i need to remember this Mm -hmm. because because this dude's deep so (laughs) so i just kept pausing it and like grabbing my computer and writing stuff down yeah so that was one of the first times i remember doing that and whenever i watch documentaries mostly documentaries i i do the same thing you know so this is that Douglas Coupland quote. He said, the art world is about finding reality defective and addressing that issue. Yeah. You know, so you're you're just being like, this shit is fucked up. Why is everything here so crazy and nonsensical yeah. and and instead of going from point A to point B, we do like the most haphazard, you know, strange way of, you know, why does so much shit not make sense? You know? Yeah, I had that... I have that thought all the time. Like I was sitting there, uh, where was it? Like a couple days ago, uh, somewhere I ordered an iced tea, I think. And I ended up with, instead of (laughs) one straw, there was two little straws in it. And I'm sitting there thinking like, who the fuck ever came up with this? 
<laughs> Why don't they dude, just make the straws bigger? Dude, I go to this Starbucks that's near my studio pretty much every day. It's like my only vice, really, is coffee. <laughs> so I know everybody that works there, and you know, everybody's really cool. And I just get like, I just get a coffee or like an Americano. Like I mm-hmm. never do anything fancy. I'm just like, just give me a coffee. Yeah. <clears throat> and these people are like, I need a non-fat, non-fat, oh, triple foam, like blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they get be... so specific and crazy. I and saw... it's always the people that are in line in front of me <laughs> and I'm waiting forever. <laughs> I just want my iced tea, plain old black iced tea. Dude, it's nothing. I, I saw some dude like threaten to break a barista's arms because he like thought he was like being rude to him or something because the guy didn't get his drink to like 210 degrees or 120 degrees or whatever it's supposed to be and i just trip out at that like how do you get from just drinking a coffee to like some complicated weird order like that like but then people would say that about us listening to drummers or something like what's the difference uh, you guys just keeping a beat. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you can make that <laughs> comparison. That's different. I think the con- the coffee thing is a control issue. Yeah. Uh, or I think the, the the music thing is just something totally different. It might just be some person who like likes to listen to top forty radio and that's all they want to hear, which is fine. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, you know. But like, yeah, they hear anything crazy. Just like if you go and like you bring some person off the street and look at Jackson Pollock or something, they're going to be like. My kid could have done this or whatever. Yeah. You know, they don't understand the context of it. Yeah. But, I mean, do you run into that here with people? Oh, yeah. That was the initial question. I have a certain group of people, like selected people that are like that. Um, and some people aren't, which is fine. It's not, it's, not def- it's not predominant in Los Angeles for sure. And I do know people who I really like as people, but they are so career driven. Yeah. Like they miss the point of everything. And like, I really like them as people, but I just can't hang out with them because that shit is just so overbearing. What would be an example of that? I mean, like meaning like, I know this one dude who I'm like, Hey man, like what's going on? Like just got back in town. Like, how you doing, man? Like some (laughs) human shit, you know, like, are you cool? Is everything okay? He's like, Oh man, you know, I'm good. I'm just, you know, at the studio producing this artist right now. (laughs) Or like, oh, I just got out of a meeting. Or it's like yeah, their just, cue to talk about their resume. Yeah. Or for I the just next got out of a minutes. session. Yeah, it's like it's like it can never be like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just sitting on the couch, man. What's up? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it sucks because I literally like some of these people that do this shit, but it just wears me out. Yeah. And I'm just like, dude, really? Like you're still fronting that hard? Yeah. Like fuck, you know? And there are people. I mean, it's Los Angeles. Yeah, there are people like that everywhere, I'm sure. But Los Angeles definitely attracts that type of a thing. So I try to keep my distance from people like that just because I tend to wear my heart on my sleeve usually. And Mm -hmm. if I'm not stoked about what's going on, I whether I want to or not, I generally make it pretty apparent um, just by sitting there and not talking, (laughs) you know, (laughs) or I just have to remove myself from the situation entirely. But. Yeah, man, it's uh, there is that in L.A. But, you know, I mean, L- the really rad thing about L.A., and everybody wants to shit on L.A. so much, but I love L.A., man. I just hope I'm able to afford a house one day. That's the <laughs> only thing, you know. I mean, I love Los Angeles. The weather's incredible. Like, I love L.A., so I, I don't think I'm ever going to leave here. But the thing that's cool about it is it's big enough, like, geographically so that, and socially so that, Whatever you're into, you can find like that weird niche of people and that community of people to like hang with. If you if you're like some weird stoner hippie like dropout, like you can go hang in Venice with like some of those people, you know? Yeah. If you're more into like weird experimental art stuff, you go hang out downtown in some loft somewhere in some commune, you know? Like if you want to so you'd say maybe I should roll the dice and look around a little more <laughs> instead of, you know, getting bummed out with this certain group. Yeah. I mean, dude, Los Angeles is huge, man. I mean, yeah. just, you can't fix. It starts to sound silly now, what I say, you know, like, why why don't I just go look somewhere else or do something else? Well, that else? shit is so. There's millions of people here. Yeah. Right? That stuff is so uh, emotionally and mentally exhausting that type of persona that you're talking about that it's draining and it makes you just go oh god fuck this whole thing yeah yeah, yeah. you know which is easy to do but you have to just go you have to just really 
have your you know your wall up and have your filters on man like yeah because there are a lot of really great people here man i mean there's i know so many people who are just incredible people Mm -hmm. you know like you just gotta you just gotta suss them out you know they're here you know i was just having coffee with my buddy john who has this band called big black delta the other day and He's one of those dudes that just gets it, man. He's all about the art, and he, he's smart, and he reads, and he watches movies, and he's just like... So, you know, it's like I really enjoy surrounding myself with people like that, you know, mm-hmm. where you can have a conversation, an intelligent conversation about some shit. And it doesn't always have to be about music. A lot yeah. of times it is, but it doesn't have to be, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but it, but it, it takes patience, man, you know? <laughs> it takes patience. I mean, there's a lot of people... There's a lot of people who, you know, I just have to keep them at arm's length, you know, yeah. for one reason or another. So, sure. You know. I like how you're saying uh, it's a it's a large geographical area, and it made me think you were going to say, so all you have to do is drive a few <laughs> miles in the other direction, and they're gone. <laughs> You'll probably never see them again. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of places in LA you don't want to go. That's for sure. Yeah. But uh but yeah man there's so many cool weird scenes, you know. What would you want to tell yourself 5 or 10 years ago <sighs> that you uh didn't understand back then? But you wow. understand it now. So It can be about life or Right, or right. I mean, just be just be patient and just do do good work. You know, and and you just stay committed and you keep riding the wave and and uh even if it's even if there's no waves to catch you just gotta keep paddling around until one comes you know you just it's the people that stick in there and hold on for the longest are the people that are, that are successful i moved down here with a few people not with them but at the same time mm-hmm. as a few people from northern california who are killer musicians and after six months or a year or two, they were like, fuck this, LA sucks. Like, I can't, you know, and it wasn't about LA. I mean, it was about them, like, not being able to make shit happen. Yeah. And they, you know, everybody that moves here, I tell them, you got to give it two to three years before shit starts happening. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody's different, but, like, you just got to be, be patient. But, but I mean, uh, this also connects earlier with what you were saying. Like, there's a context that you have to understand about fi- about working things out here. Mm-hmm. Uh, that people in other places might not understand. Well, the guy in Oklahoma sure. might have things to sure. say about L.A. and he's sure. never even been. But it's a different kind of, you know, I don't know. There's this whole evil music industry and right. Hollywood right. And, right. and all the fake people and right. all this stuff. But then it's it's even weirder than that. Like there's a sure. lot more weird detail <laughs> to how fucked up it is in some ways. Yeah. Even though you're saying there's the good parts and I sure. agree and I sure. totally love living here. Sure. But uh, it's weird. Like yeah. there's a, there's weird shit to figure <laughs> out that doesn't, it's not definable in any normal way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's weird social shit you have yeah. to figure out and, and there's weird industry shit, but the industry shit changes on a daily basis. Yeah. Just because of the way technology's changing and and the way the industry's trying to adapt to that um, slowly, that's changing on a daily basis. But I, whenever someone brings up like the, the shitty side of the darker side of the LA industry, I always I always for some reason think of this think of this story that an A and R guy, which is a, also a rare breed. <laughs> In, in the music industry now, thank God, because yeah. most of those people are just useless. Um, useless yes men. But someone, an A&R guy told me like, oh yeah, um, there was this guy who worked for said record company back in the, you know, when, whenever it was, 80s or 90s, who used to sign boy bands back when that shit was big. Mm-hmm. Sign boy bands like... To, you know, with the, the promise of this huge record deal and blah, 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 blah. And they're going to be the next NSYNC or Backstreet Boys. He would sign them for the sole purpose of shelving them and sitting on them so that they wouldn't be in direct competition with the NSYNC or Backstreet Boys. That was his job. Yeah. You're going to promise these people the world and then just completely shelf them and sabotage them. Yeah. That was his day job. Yeah, like that's a, a literal, like it yes. really was his overt yeah. what position. Do you, yeah, what do you do? I lie to people and then shelf 
their band and crush their dreams. Yeah. Not not saying that like a, a boy band was the most high level artistic thing <laughs> you could do, but it's yeah. still shady as fuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's you know endless amounts of stories of record labels fucking up things because of just their sheer uh, idiocy, you mm -hmm. know, and the bureaucratic red tape of a major label and not being able to, to have anybody that's responsible for anything like every corporation, you know, it's like, well, who dropped the ball here? Yeah. And you know, you can never find somebody. It's always like, well, this kind of person that sort of did this and then it's this, do, it will, uh, you know, it's never, you can never get a direct answer, but yeah, LA can be weird, man. It can be real weird. I mean, dude, I know I know someone told me a story about a dude. I mean, I know similar situations like this, including stuff that's happened to me, I'm sure. I know a dude who was auditioning in some band and they were auditioning. He got the gig. They were auditioning bass players. Mm -hmm. Dude came in, at, you know, looked the part, sounded great, was a cool dude. Everything was was awesome. And they were like, cool, man, I think that's the dude. And then the artist was like, nah, he was wearing, like, uh, a wallet with, like, a chain on it. Like, uh, <laughs> swear to God. Yeah. You know, swear to God. So, you never know, man. You could wear the wrong shoes. Who knows? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I was talking to someone who is uh, pretty successful uh -huh. in music. And the topic of... Scott Henderson came up. All this good stuff to say about him. And then the conversation suddenly turned and he said, yeah, but I would never work with him or hang out with him because he, he wears a really dorky watch. <laughs> and and it was like deadpan serious. And I thought, is this a Wait, <laughs> somebody really said this? They're that shallow um, that they wouldn't... Uh, they were serious? Yeah, completely serious. That they wouldn't work with him or hang out with him or like that, but the, but agreed that he was a total like visionary guitarist, you know. But, yeah, that's but really, that he he wears a dorky watch. Yeah, that's really weird. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> I've, I've got nothing for that other than that dude is a crazy crazy guitar player. I've heard you use, use this term before. Uh huh. I still don't know what it means, and I I consider myself pretty hip on the drumming thing. <laughs> Uh, even if at this point in my life I'm just a groupie. Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> what the hell are gospel chops? Oh, Jesus. I mean, can you just explain what the hell it is? <sighs> is it a thing like hipsters? No, no, How no. There's, okay. but, I mean, there's no nobody ever no, let me accepts that they're a hipster. <laughs> let me explain what What it, is it? Let me explain what Does it, it exist? Yes. Oh, it definitely exists. Okay. So here's the deal. <clears throat> I don't go to church. I absolutely abhor religion of all kinds. Um, I think it's especially Christianity is one of the most evil things on the planet. Okay. So I'm not going to church services. Mm -hmm. That's not my thing. So I didn't grow up in church. I did go to synagogue and temple. I had a bar mitzvah. You know, I did that whole thing. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, I'm not in, into religion. You know, there are certain aspects of Judaism, I think, that are, that are great. I love the culture of it. I love the humor in Judaism, I, I, I think there's uh, a, a love for, for learning and knowledge in Judaism. All of that stuff that's more of a cultural aspect of Judaism I really mm -hmm. am into. Yeah. But any type of, I'm into some aspects of Buddhism, but any type of religious dogma, you know, especially like the Catholic guilt thing, mm -hmm. I just abhor. Yeah. Anyway, my point is, to get that out of the way, I don't go to church. So... You know, I grew up in Northern California, so I moved down to L.A. I've told this story a million times. I basically hook up with Ronald Bruner at the Baked Potato watching Gary Novak play with either Michael Landau or Holdsworth or somebody. Okay. And I'm a huge fan of Gary Novak. I don't know if you've checked him out at all. Mm -mm. <laughs> I know the name. Yeah, I'll show you some stuff. He's a freak. Okay. Um, huge fan of him. So I get there super early, sit down in the front row. So I can, right next to his kit, and right before the drum solo, Ron comes out of the back and sits in the aisle. <laughs> like, you've been to the potato. Yeah. Yeah, like the walkway. He just sits right in between me and him, so I mm -hmm. can't see anything. Okay. We start talking, and, you know, 
This is 2004, so no one knew who he was at this point, really. And he's just super cocky, and uh, and I'm like, all right, well, you know, so I was like, come by my room, you know, like, let's play. And I was like, this guy's either going to be terrible or, like, unbelievable. And, man, I just... It was like I felt sick to my stomach. I didn't know what way was up or down, left or right. Like I'd never heard anybody play like that. I was like <laughs> a freak, absolute freak. So we became pretty close. Now, which guy is this? Ronald, yeah. Ronald Bruner Jr. Okay, Ronald Bruner Jr. Um, so, you know, he played with suicidal tendencies for a really long time. Um, George Duke, Stanley Clark, Lee Rittenauer, uh, Kenny Garrett, uh, Stevie Wonder, Prince, all kinds of people. Okay. I, we just started hanging out like every day and playing drums and for about two years we were pretty much inseparable so he would take me to these sheds at these churches um, in like Watts and Compton and shit or just like in mm-hmm. someone's studio in the valley or whatever and it was this whole weird culture that like, when you a, say sheds so like you go a terminology in, right? yeah you just go into a, like a shed like a wood shed yeah like a studio okay or a practice room or a lockout okay, or whatever okay. So that would mean in that context, but then someone's also like, "Yeah, let's go shed." Like, okay. let's go, let's go, you know, or we're there's a shed over here, you know, or we're shedding or whatever. That just means you're trading fours. Okay. Oh, that's all that means. So okay, so real quick, yeah. When you guys talk about playing drums together, yeah, you talk about this all the time. Like you have drummers come by your space. I still do now, now nowadays, but it's not for that. Before but, it was like, but I mean, when you jam with another drummer, yeah, what you actually do is trade fours. A or lot something. of times, but there's I, a lot of dudes who I have over now. We just kind of like trade ideas back and forth, and it's real loose. Okay, it's not like bam, 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 just knocking. Okay, you know, knocking. It just I, seems like so hard to do. Because it is because it, it's practically drums are so loud. How yeah. are you talking over them, and what are you? Well, the lot of the hell times do you, do you just that? well, that's the thing when you're shedding like. I mean, I play really loud, and so does Ron. So, like, you know, when it was, like, me and Ron and Chris Coleman and Tony Royster, like, all in a room together, it was just fucking really loud. Yeah. Really loud. So, basically, me and Ron hung out a bunch, and I got kind of plugged into that whole scene. Just, and and the thing is, what gospel chops are is basically those dudes, you know, back in the day, like... Gerald Hayward and, you know, Aaron Spears and, you know, Brian Fraser Moore and Marvin McQuitty. And there's all these dudes back 15, 20 years ago, maybe a little bit less. Okay. This is my understanding of it. They were trying to play these, like, fusion licks, like Weckl or, or, or Vinny or Gad so they were trying or to play like those guys. Yeah. They okay. were trying to kind of play that kind of stuff yeah but it ended up turning into like their own interpretation of it because a lot of those dudes aren't schooled which is fine okay um so 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 they had like this filter they were looking at it through and it just kind of morphed into this whole other thing okay um so you have a lot of the same things as like fusion drumming the main three things is like there's it's linear nothing's hitting at the same time okay you got over the beat and over the bar phrases mm-hmm. and there's no rests you're just like yeah. you're just playing fucking every note there is okay so that's kind of my understanding of it and I'm sure someone else could be like no 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 this is what's going on but that's what I kind of piece okay. things together as from my own understanding I got super you know into that whole thing back in the day like 2004 2005 and I was just like this white guy hanging with all these black dudes and because I worked on a lot of fusion stuff when I was younger I was like oh this is just that yeah so so I was able to kind of figure out what they were doing not like I could play what some of those dudes are playing because some of those yeah. guys are unbelievable but like I was at least able to be like oh okay I get it and just at least keep my head above water so Gerald from Gospel Chops asked me to be on that Shed Sessions Volume 2 DVD in like 2000. I think we filmed it in like 2006 and it came out in like 2007 or something. I So I did that DVD and, you know, but the, but since time has passed, that became like a very, I kind of look at it, it's kind of like Limp Biscuit or something <laughs> or like that whole swing, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy, Cherry Pop and Daddy's yeah, like yeah, reunion. Yeah. It was like its own really short time period thing and then yeah. it flashes out, you yeah. know? So like now around town, Gospel Chops is like around LA, that's a bad word. Like, oh, yeah, it's one of those gospel chops dudes. Because a lot of those dudes will, because in church, you just play whatever the fuck you want to play. Mm-hmm. Because, like, 
they're like, let him use you, you know, and just like play whatever the fuck you want, <laughs> yeah. whenever you want. Song doesn't matter. So a lot of these dudes will just rip all over a chorus or what. It's just is so unmusical. Yeah. So in the past few years, that's become like a really bad word in, around town. Like, oh, kind of like how those, gent is also a oh, bad okay, word. Yeah, don't get me started on that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the same shit. It's just kind of, you know, it's like, ugh. You know, like, so I've been trying really hard to just distance myself from that whole thing. Uh, because it's just like someone yelling at you really fast. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's no, there's what makes what makes a phrase is the space. And I want to talk about that a little bit too. Yeah, that's another topic I have. What is it with music where people always feel like it has to fit into a genre? Why does a song have to have only one mood, or an album has one mood where it's like we play angry all the time right. and always fast? Right. But if you saw a movie like that, it would just be like a big battle scene that went for two hours. Right. Why, right. Why can't musicians bring in some more like, oh, here's a very quiet right. part for an extended amount of time. That is- so the first thing you said about like hyper genre things. Yeah. That shit drives me crazy. Like mm-hmm. I was thinking about that this morning because there's this band who I really dig from the UK called Sixth. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And I guess they're like just getting back. I just to- saw that thing on Facebook yeah. too. I saw that pop up. Yeah, Somebody yeah, yeah. said Sixth is getting back. Yeah. Again. So I was all super stoked because yeah. I think those guys are awesome. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, even though the guitar players and the drummer and like they're they're technically incredible, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, there's still hooks there. Yeah. Which is what matters. Mm-hmm. If something's just like technically incredible, I have no desire to listen. I don't care. Yeah. There has to be a hook there. There has to be a melody there. There has to yeah. be some sort of musical thing happening. Shredding for the sake of shredding is I don't give a fuck about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that article popped up this morning. I was like, oh, shit. Like, this is awesome. And then I click on it and it's some dude from one of those like metal sucks websites or like blabbermouth or some shit yeah. like that where it's just all these kids just talking shit about everything but it wasn't even that it was just the article started off with gent band sixth and like a they're not a gent band like mm-hmm. at all they couldn't be anything further from that but why do you have to start off by classifying like the genre metal fans are the worst with that shit post hardcore <laughs> yeah. like doom metal like they have like all these sub genres of yeah. shit and it's like what it's like you guys are worse than jazzers and i feel like i can say this because i play everything i play yeah. every style of music and i love all styles of music so you kind of look at these things from the outside and you're just like why do you guys have to fit these styles of music into like compartments and sub compartments and sub sub compartments and it's mm-hmm. like do you like this shit cool like, obviously, I understand that Pantera is different than Meshuga. Obviously. Yeah. But, like, they're both metal bands. Mm-hmm. Like, just fucking be done with it, you know? Yeah. Like, why do you people have to hyper-classify stuff? It drives me fucking crazy. Because yeah. it comes, it becomes about that. It becomes about what it is. It's like when Opeth released that, uh, probably their latest album. I don't know if you know that one. Uh-uh. I kind of stopped listening to them a while ago. I um, got so tired of the dun 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 dun, dun, dun happening all the fucking uh, time. I don't know. I couldn't take it anymore. But they did a, a record that was, there was no growling. Oh, the Damnation record? No. Okay. Uh, I'm, Heritage. Oh, okay. Do you know that one? It, no. It, uh, it didn't have the growling. And I remember so many people commenting that they don't like Opeth anymore and because that album didn't have growling on it. Yeah, those are people that like, have, that's uh, that's so narrow-minded. Yeah, absolutely. You, how can you you can't listen to music that doesn't have growling? Absolutely. But there are a lot of dumb people out there. It's yeah. unbelievable. Are you sure you're not talking about that Damnation record? No, it was uh Heritage. Okay. Cuz they came out with that Deliverance and Damnation those two records at the same time. Yeah. And Deliverance was super heavy and Damnation was just acoustic guitars. And, like, I think that was vocals. before Okay. It was lo- it was a while ago. Yeah, I think that record's incredible. I went to see them play that that album live, mm-hmm. and people were just screaming at them and insulting them, telling them to play the old <laughs> stuff. And the singer Michael uh-huh. Lockerfeld said, um, "Yeah, so we have a new album out." And there was just like very little reaction, and he just said, "Yeah, fuck you too." See, that's terrible, man. It sucks when it sucks when it gets like that with your fans, man. But that's how that's metal fans are the worst. 
like the absolute worst with that shit and it sucks i don't know where that's all coming from i don't remember i mean you know it's the it's the internet it's a big part to do with it but I don't remember people being like that in the, in the 90s. Yeah, I remember. I don't remember there ever being a genre of what Primus was when it came out. Totally. It was just, it was just like, I don't know what this is, but it's cool. Yeah, you know it was, I mean? it was like, weird, and it's yeah. a Lollapalooza, and it's kind of funky. Yeah, and, exactly. It's like, just like it is what it is. You yeah, know? Like, were, it was never like, oh, there are 50 bands that are post, yeah, post-pre-funk like, metal exactly, hardcore dude. or yeah, something. It's like, Bay Area. Yeah, like try and classify Bongle, you know? It's like, yeah. Why? It's just is it cool? Yeah, cool. Like if it's not, then who cares? Yeah, that stuff drives me nuts. I don't know where that's coming from, but it's super prevalent in in metal. It's so obnoxious. I don't know. Like I mean, huge... I just you know, there's so much possibility in music that you've got melody, rhythm, pitch, dynamics, timbre, texture, all these things you can yep. play with and make something out yep. of. And it all comes down to these specific little yeah. things. Well, it's like, just a lot of these people just don't get it. And yeah. that's another... That's Growling. Exa- that's exactly... Like that's the, what it comes down to, growling. But that's exactly what you said. That's exactly the reason why I think pop music is so challenging. Because you have a set of guidelines yeah. that you have to adhere to, you know, sometimes more strictly than others. But it's saying you need, you need a verse, you need a... a you might need a pre-chorus, but you need a verse, a chorus, a verse, a chorus, a bridge, mm-hmm. and an outro. Yeah. Maybe an intro, maybe a post-chorus. There's the sort of things you can hear in there, but it's really painting by numbers. Like, you yeah. need to have these it's things. It's a haiku or, you know, sure. it's got those. Exactly. It's the same exact thing. Exactly. It's a great analogy. So, saying, this is what you need to have. It's and like, these are the rules of the game that we're agreeing to play here. Yep. This and is the pro- And you're probably going to use one of these chord progressions. Yeah. So, like, you have most of it figured out for you already, but how are you going to make something new and interesting yeah. and different? Mm-hmm. That's super tough. That's way more difficult than just being like, well, yeah, you can do whatever you want and make it crazy and weird and there's no rules and do whatever you want and make crazy, yeah. weird music. Right. That's way easier in a certain aspect. Not yeah, like yeah, overall, yeah. you can't make a blanket statement like that, but yeah. you know what I mean? Like, uh, cause I used to poo poo like pop music when I was a kid, you know, yeah. I'd be like, Oh, that stuff's, you know, like that's for, that's for simpletons and you know, like, yeah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Right. and then you grow up and you're like, Oh shit. Yeah. You know, like you put on like that old tears for fear stuff and you're like, Oh my God, like these guys were killing this shit, you know, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or, you know, Peter Gabriel or Phil Collins or, Whatever, man. Just good pop music, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, that shit is really hard. Like, really hard to, yeah. to write, you know? So, there's a whole other level of challenges. That, something that like Toto. Totally. Like Even though that shit hasn't, a, hasn't aged super yeah. gracefully. But, I mean, there's some of those Toto songs, the guitar part is like a chord. Yeah, or yeah. two chords that come in. From one of the dudes who's like the r- most rippingest yeah, dudes yeah. ever. Yeah. You know? Because he knows, like, he's like, this is what needs to happen, you know? And I'll solo eventually at some point, but, like, <laughs> I don't need to do it now, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So, you know, all you, can, you can't really concern yourself with that stuff, though. All you got to do is just be like, hey, this is what I'm doing, and these are the people I want to surround myself with. And, like, so many people go, man, have you watched? Like, I have friends who are smart, and, like, they send me these stupid fucking YouTube clips of, like, some random bullshit that, like, I don't care about like some fucking four year old playing drums. Yeah. I don't give a fuck about kids playing instruments marginally well for their yeah. age. Like wait until that kid turns 16 and starts doing meth or like starts doing heroin <laughs> and like he grows up and like he has to deal with real fucking life. Like yeah. I don't care about some kid who's like good. Like wait until like they're like old and can really say some real shit, mm-hmm. you know, like or you know, like I just that whole that whole thing. It's almost like a vaudevillian idea yeah. of things. It's really creepy that our society is so preoccupied with like these four, five, and six year olds like juggling two liters of Coca Cola or whatever the <laughs> fuck. You know? <laughs> just all this shit that just does not matter in, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. I don't know. My point is like just don't concern yourself with stupid shit that doesn't matter that's hyper temporary that's another thing man we live in this society where everything is so temporary the lifespan of a tweet what do you think that is 10 minutes seems less than 10 minutes yeah I don't know. Like a you, minute. Know what, you know what i mean like instagram 
same like five ten minutes yeah you know like like facebook maybe a day maybe yeah so everything is just like that man and and uh it's hard to find anything with like depth you know because everything is just it's just just, people are probably writing albums to now write something that will be good on facebook yeah dude yeah, you see all that all that stuff on iTunes, like mixed for iTunes. Weird. Or mastered for iTunes or whatever it is. It's like, ugh. Have you checked out that uh, Ayal Amir guy? Uh, he did a cover of uh, Moves Like Jagger? No, this is exactly the kind Project of thing I'm talking RNL. about. Uh-uh. This uh-uh. is exactly the kind of shit I don't watch. No, I think I'm, I'm, I was actually changing the subject to something else. Okay. It's actually something really cool. Okay. And I thought you might like it. So uh-uh. I thought maybe you'd heard of it. Uh-uh. Something so, I'm something I really like lately. Okay, so he just covers the song, but does well. No, he's he's done a few covers. Okay, um, but his original stuff is great too. He's okay. a guy out of Israel. Oh, and oh. I heard he's coming to Nam. Huh. I so I've no thought idea. about thought about trying to go to Nam just for that, just to see that guy. Um, yeah, I'd like know. to get him on this podcast. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen yeah. it. I mean, put it out into the ether, man. It has melody. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly the kind of shit I don't watch because it's like most, most, like 99.9% of covers, like, I don't fucking care. Like, I'd rather hear the original person do it because it's just some other person that's going to do it not as well as the original. I mean, you know, there are exceptions like Jeff Buckley singing Grace. I mean, excuse me, Hallelujah. You know, like, or or James Blake doing uh, doing that Feist tune. God damn it. I keep the spacing on the song. There are exceptions to the rule of people doing it very well. My version of Creed. <laughs> Dude, I showed that to the Creed guys. <laughs> Did I ever tell you that? I think so, but I don't remember <laughs> what you said. Uh, well, I showed it to my buddy Eric, who's playing guitar in Creed, and uh, he fucking thought it was the funniest thing <laughs> ever. He was, like, pissing his pants. I still keep meaning to show that to Mark, um, which I will. I would uh, be honored if someday yeah, you played yeah. my version of Creed. Oh, too, I, 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 I listened to their stuff a lot back then. <laughs> Dude, Mark, I mean, you know, I've never met Scott Stapp. That guy's obviously a raging moron. But uh, all the other dudes are awesome. The rest, I mean, I've known those dudes forever. Uh, and, and Mark and and uh, Scott and all the guys are just, they're uh, Scott Phillips, like the drummer. They're all just really awesome dudes. Um, I really like Mark a lot. Um He's a killer guitar player. Um, so, so yeah, I'll show it to them. <laughs> I keep meaning to do that. <laughs> do you ever get that feeling uh, when you listen to some music that totally blows you away? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like that pop thing you were talking about, how mm-hmm. this is really hard to do. Mm-hmm. Like, there's some music that I'll hear, like A.L. Amir's. Yeah. Uh, I wish I could pronounce his name. I don't even know. It's phonetic. Okay. A lot of stuff he writes is in Hebrew, so I can't even read right. the words. Right. There's no phonetics to it right. for me. Right. But um, it's tough. I had to learn how to do it. Oh wow! Yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Um, I don't remember how to do it, <laughs> but I had to do it for my bar mitzvah. It's a pain in the ass. Thank when you. I hear that Al Amir yeah. stuff, I just feel like giving up completely. Like there's no point in me ever trying to write any music ever again yeah. because it's so good. It's like like yeah, like the melody to Africa or something. Yeah, it's yeah. like how do you ever do that? Yeah, there's a mixture of that for sure. It's like simultaneously being like I give up and like also being very very inspired, you know. I think that's super super common, you know, like um what's something that has done that to you lately if you, if you could think of it? Uh, I was going to tweet this morning uh like hey James Blake like stop hogging all the genius. <laughs> <laughs> like leave some for everybody else, you know. I think that dude is so so onto some next level shit, man. He's he's an absolute freak, um, and he's really young too. He's like twenty three, twenty two, twenty three. He's hmm. come out with his like second or third record. That's too young. He's but dude, this shit is so deep, man. It's fucking crazy. Um, I was just nerding out on a bunch of Zach Danziger shit. He, have you checked out Zach? Oh man. He's no. great. He's a, he's a friend of mine. He's incredible. Um, D'Antoni, who played in Mars Volta after me, like that guy's absolutely insane. Hmm. Um, Mark Giuliano, he's a good buddy of mine. You know, check out those dudes, and and then of course always going back to Vinny and Gad and, and Tony Williams and just going like fuck. 
you know. <laughs> But it's that simultaneous feeling of being like, oh, man, this is so rad. And also just like, oh, my God, like, I could never do this, you know? Yeah. I think that's just they go hand in hand, you know? You just have to figure out how you're going to do your own version of whatever it is that you do, you know? But yeah, and that's, that's what's so fun a lot of times, having access to that stuff out here. Sure. Being able to be next to somebody that actually does that. And I have to say, even though you probably won't like this. I kind of felt that that excitement and joy and like throwing my hands up in the air like what the fuck <laughs> when you were doing your uh, sledgehammer <laughs> solo. Oh, well, because uh, you know, you're not that's not something that you're uh, an advocate of. No, it's not. And and I had the, a definite like disclaimer like beforehand like yeah. this is strictly for practicing purposes yeah. only. And, you know, I would never play like this on a, if I'm actually playing this song. Yeah. Because that song is so great and the groove is so great. But, yeah, it's just, it's, I just like using that song to, to kind of solo over because sometimes because it's the tempo is just nice medium yeah. tempo and it's just, it's easy for that type of a thing. But, uh, well, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I did a clinic tour with Tony Royster. Like we did a couple of clinics together a few mm-hmm. years ago, and and we were using that song and just trading for us back and forth over that. And to me, def- it's just fun. It's like sure. it's just so sure. You um, just have to take it for what it is. And yeah, be like, this is an isolated like incident. Yeah, where we're you know doing this thing, but like you gotta you gotta be like you know I would never do anything like this in a real world situation because most people don't get that. You know, or not most people. Some people don't get that. You know, they're like, "Oh, okay, cool, I can just do whatever I want." It's like, no, it's because like a lot of times when you're trading fours, it's like either you're just doing it or you might do it with a click. But when you're playing with music, like you have something to play off of. When you're just going back and forth, it's like it's it's just you or maybe the other person. You know, Mm -hmm. but like it's fun doing it with music because you have something to bounce off of. You know. I have had a few experiences out here where, where you described it as being in the moment and experiencing something with a performance. Sure. And I have to say that while I was at DW that time when Morgan was there mm-hmm. and Danny Carey came in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I have never had any interest in Danny Carey and always felt like he was overrated uh-huh. and, and I never got into the tool thing. Uh-huh. And I always made fun of it uh-huh. and I was like, oh, tool, blah, right, blah, blah. Right, right, right. Finally, I was standing there, and Danny Carey sat down at a drum kit and started messing with it. I think it was maybe the one that you used that day. Yeah, maybe. I it think was he like was some sitting... giant 70s kit yeah, or something. Yeah, 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 the concert tom kit. I think he might have been sitting on Morgan's. I can't remember. No, it was on the other side oh, of the Oh, it was? Room. Oh, okay, okay. There might have been a few different drum yeah, sets. Yeah, sure. But it was unbelievable hearing that guy play uh-huh. right there in front of me yeah. and feeling his, the yeah. actual sounds yeah. fr- coming from his playing. Yeah, Danny's incredible. And uh, that's something that changes your perspective when you're actually in a room with someone. Mm-hmm. And people might want to consider that when they're bad mouthing, absolutely Miley Cyrus gig or something. Well, people like that. just—it seems like it's just a knee, knee-jerk reaction now. Yeah, like it's just—it's that's like how people react. Like, oh, well, uh, like just right off the bat, like that—that's people's go-to is ne- negativity for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, Danny's incredible, man. I played along to a bunch of Tool stuff when I was younger, and, and he's a great dude, and Ryan, his girlfriend's awesome, and they're all, mm-hmm. I'm really close with them, so. Yeah. So, yeah, so I was, like, texting him, like, hey, I'm doing this thing with Morgan, like, you should fucking come up, yeah. you know, and they're like, oh, cool, we'll come up. So, like, yeah, Danny's great, but uh, there is something to be said about, like, I'm trying to think of a specific instance where, well, oh, it you It almost kind of weakens it, though, when it when you squeeze Danny Carey into a little <laughs> piece of plastic and put it in speakers. There's something lost that I didn't experience until I actually saw him play and well, right in front of me feeling the sound waves from the drums. Well, he's a big dude. Yeah. <laughs> he's a pretty menacing-looking yeah, dude. I mean, he's like a giant teddy bear, but he's a, yeah. he's a pretty big dude. So, you know, I think, I, I mean, one experience I can think of like that was like seeing Joe Travers with ZPZ oh, yeah. a long time ago. I just didn't know who he was. Yeah. I'd never heard of him. This is like a long time ago, like when they were doing those open rehearsals at Third Encore. Like I don't know what that is. It was like six or seven years ago. It was a long time ago. Uh, for some tour or something, I don't remember. Um, and, I love uh, Joe Travers. Yeah, but I didn't know who he was. I'd never heard of him. So... I'm walking in here, walking in here like, who's this fucking guy? You know, like, yeah. how is he going to fucking play Vinny's parts and Terry's parts? And, 
And, and he know, doesn't look the part no, either. He doesn't look very, like some badass. He's very unassuming. Yeah, yeah. He looks like some IT dude. Yeah. Same like Nate Wood from Nebo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they look yeah. like they're some exactly. computer tech. Yeah. And so <laughs> I sit down and I'm like, you know, with that attitude, like, who's this guy? Because I just didn't know who he was. And then yeah. I was just like, holy fuck. Yeah. Like, this dude is killing. And he perfectly, like, he just perfectly kind of danced around everybody's different interpretations of different things and you know kind of picked and choose to things from what he wanted and he was mm-hmm. fucking incredible man yeah and i was just like oh shit and i was like definitely a mental note like i've had that a few times too where i go to something that i don't think i'm gonna like at all and then i see it and i'm totally blown away yeah so there are always the, you have to go see things for yourself sometimes absolutely and totally let go of what you expect and then the opposite can be true sometimes too <laughs> yeah you're just like fuck that's disappointing. But uh but yeah, I'm trying to think of any other and I didn't even have any preconceived notions. I was just like ignorant, you know. Yeah. Tom Petty did a concert in San Francisco at, mm-hmm. at uh some big festival. I mm-hmm. went to it. Never had any interest in Tom Petty, mm-hmm. but I thought, "Oh, this is pretty good." And then Steve Winwood came out, which <laughs> I knew nothing about either, but I remember like yeah. feeling like, "Oh, this is like <laughs> <laughs> yeah dad music yeah, or totally, something totally. like i was not yeah. interested uh, and he blew me away dude the same exact he thing was up there running around with a guitar and everything same and I'm like, exact this guy thing is so good me. dude i went to see my buddy carl von den bosch who's a killer percussionist uh he plays with steve winwood uh and you know shot a and a bunch of people yeah so like three or four years ago i went to see him play with steve winwood opening for tom petty at the verizon Okay. Amphitheater in Irvine. Mm-hmm. And same thing. I was like, oh, I'm just going to go see my buddy. Like, this, yeah, this, you know, they were, and, and same thing. Like, Steve Woodburn, I was like, fuck, this guy's <laughs> killing. Yeah. And then Tom Petty came on, and, you know, I played like Tom Petty tunes when I was in like my high school band or whatever, or for, mm-hmm. for a grade school band, you know, like Free Fallen or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I was just like, oh my God, like this song. Like every song's a hit. Like, oh yeah, yeah this song. Oh yeah, this one. Yep. Just like hit after hit after hit. It was crazy. Yeah. And I was just like, holy shit, man. But yeah, I thought Steve Winwood was, was incredible. And uh Jack Johnson played that same concert. Uh huh. I thought he was great. <laughs> like I the all the things that you think you're gonna hate yep. end up being they come off great live. Yeah. It's so weird. It's a it's just a totally different thing, you know. And that's tough to do on the bigger venues like that is have like some sort of level of intimacy or connection with the audience it's really tough what kind of an audience uh have you been seeing at those miley shows well who like who goes to that i mean it's mostly teenagers you know but i mean when we just did the staples show for the kiss jingle ball thing um i mean that was every kind of everything it was everybody was there i mean Everything from like teenage girls to teenage guys to moms to dads to like whatever. It was like all kinds of people. But what was interesting about that gig, because it's the first like, you know, I play with Juliette Lewis, but that was vastly different in a multitude of ways. The thing, I, the lesson that I had to learn real quick is like, no one gives a fuck about me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we did, we did a bunch of stuff, but when we did the MTV Music Awards in Amsterdam, um, like we're, you know, it's like it was like a big arena, you know, like probably twenty thousand people or something, and uh, so we come out to play Wrecking Ball, and uh, everybody's going nuts, and they're all, you know, and then there's a podium like a- across the, the the venue, like on the other side of the venue where she comes up out of and she's hmm. singing from the podium. Yeah. She's not on stage with us. Okay. So I'm, so I'm, you know, got up on stage, it's all dark and like everybody's freaking out, everybody's got their phones out and then she pops up like way over on the other side of the venue and everybody in the entire arena just turns around. Yeah. So we're all playing to the back of people's <laughs> heads. Like everything. Not one person is looking at us. Yeah. Everybody's looking at her and I was yeah. like, Wow. Like this is, this is this is interesting. Like this is, a, yeah. you know, I've never had that experience before. But like, it's not like I mean, I totally get it. She's she's the biggest pop star in the world right now. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, and also that could be anybody if it's you know like. But but doing a pop gig is <clears throat> totally different than anything else. You know, it's it's really not about you. Yeah, and that's fine. I don't care. I don't have anything to prove. Like I was saying, like I'm there to make her sound good. It's all about her. And that's fine. 
that is what it is, you know. And if you have any misconceptions about that, you're going to figure that out real quick. You know, it's not about you. It's about the artist. It's a professional, it's like a theatrical yeah, thing, right? Sure. I mean, it's really put together. Yeah, I mean, you know, she is super on point, super organized, really, really cool, um, really talented. Uh, I've got nothing but just a ton of respect for her. So we're going to go to a few questions here from the Facebook people. <laughs> I wasn't sure what this even meant, but someone asked, what, what's your favorite strain? And I was thinking, like, well, I remember he said he has something with his leg, like he strained his leg at some point or his hip. Uh, I don't know what. And then something about a strain, and I yeah. thought, well, maybe bacteria? or uh, And then the guy said weed. Oh, and Jesus I, and Christ. I don't so I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, it's just, everybody assumes because I have crazy hair that I'm just some huge pothead. Yeah. And that's not the case. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to blow that one off. I'd like to, you know, ignore the question. That, this is from Raphael Collado. Mm. Uh, it says, which drummers informed your style? Which I think is, I don't think that's even useful to ask anymore. Right. But there's the one that says, describe your style. Which we also went into earlier when we talked about genre. Sure. But he says he's interested in... in if you can verbalize it or how you'd verbalize it. Yeah, I don't even know if that's possible. I mean, I, I can't really have an objective perspective on my own playing. Um, I mean, I guess I'm just trying to take what I, what I like about other people and, and filter it through everything I've learned or haven't learned, and that's what comes out. That's all I can really say. Same as everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah exactly. <laughs> so here's another question from Raphael, and mm -hmm. I'll sort of paraphrase this, but did you have to adjust anything about your playing, or what specifically did you have to train yourself to do when you were playing with Miley? Luckily, Stacy, who's been MDing and, and playing that gig for the whole time, for seven or eight years now, um, is similar to, m to my playing uh, or I should say my playing is similar to his in the way that we both hit really hard or can hit really hard. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which, you know, maybe is the reason why he asked me to do it because, uh, you know, there's not going to be a notice, a hugely noticeable difference when I'm playing and he's not, you know, because again, everybody's got to be comfortable. And if it's some other dude in there doing a bunch of wacky different shit, everybody's going to be like, oh, it's going to take some while to getting used to. But I didn't really have to, I really just, again, like I'm trying to play his parts exactly right. And if he's, or the record exactly right, or even his fills, and there aren't a lot of them, like I'm talking like two beats here and there, you know, like I'm trying to play exactly what he's playing. So, um, you know, the way I hit things and everything, I didn't have to adjust that at all. But I was freaked out when we were doing TV that, like, because I have a tendency to kind of, like, jump up and down yeah, <laughs> a yeah. little bit. And I saw I, a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't really think about it anymore at this point. And my hair is out. So, like, <laughs> when we're doing these TV shows, like, I'm usually just directly behind her. So, mm -hmm. like, in the background. So I was like, holy shit, like, I hope you know, this isn't distracting, <laughs> you know, like seriously, yeah. Yeah. like I hope this isn't visually distracting, even yeah. though I'm not playing a whole bunch of crazy shit. I might be yeah. like, who the, the fuck is going on back there? Yeah. Um, but luckily they, everybody loved it. And they were like, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It looks great. So, yeah. um, but that's the kind of stuff you have to be concerned about. Like, am I, am I taking away? Yeah. It's also visual performance. Absolutely. So it's stuff like that, that you have to be concerned about. But you know, basically I just tried to play Stacy's parts note for note. And he was real cool like real loose like hey man like this is kind of this is what the vibe is i need you to do this this and this but once you do those things like you know make your own like it's cool mm -hmm. but i still just was like you know i'd add in things here and there but it was very 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 sparse mm. again i'm just trying to make everybody comfortable i'm not trying to add in a bunch of stuff so, so i really didn't have to change my playing much at all i mean other than like i'm playing his his kit okay which he sets up a little bit differently than me but other than that that was pretty much the only thing i had to get used to is there a musical director in that situation yeah, other than other than him? I mean, no. Or is he actually, he was he the, there directing? Yeah, sometimes. Oh, okay. Most of the time. Because he's, oh. he's also playing with Matchbox 20. Oh, I so, see. So that's why I'm subbing for him. So he would, sometimes he would be there for a couple days and then be like, okay, man, now you're on your own and I have to go do this other stuff. Okay. So, but sometimes he wasn't. I really liked this question from Gemma Hodges, mm -hmm. um, which I feel like 
there's an interesting way this can be answered without naming a number. Mm. But she asks, how much do you make? <laughs> um, I make enough to support my lifestyle. Yeah. I'll put it, put it that way. Does this sort of thing pay better than, let's say... Um, doing a local gig. Uh, oh some yeah, of course. Form. Yeah, of course. I mean, you have to take it for what it is. This is 2013. You know, mm-hmm. you know, no one's making millions of dollars here. Yeah. You know, it's it's it's. Uh, I mean, besides maybe like the full-on artist, you know, or or you know, Ticketmaster or something. You know, <laughs> like, but you know, I mean, they take they take care of me. You know. Here's a question from Peter L. Munn. Do you find more fulfillment in playing more rhythmically complex music, or do you find yourself enjoying simplicity just as much? That's a very black and white way of looking at music. That's not how I think about music. <laughs> you know, like That's a good I don't, way to put it. Yeah, I don't think about music as being how many... I don't, I, don't, I don't correlate how many notes I'm playing with how good it is. The two are not interrelated whatsoever. Uh, maybe when I was 13 I thought that. It's like you like artwork with lots of lines. Yeah. How many lines does this yeah. one have? <laughs> exactly. It's like, what? Um, all I care about is that the music is good and the people are cool, man. Mike Stone uh, is a guy I've done some stuff with, and he he's curious about setting up different kits for each individual gig mm. or adapting tuning. I don't want to get into the specifics of that because that's a whole other world. Right, right. But, uh, he asks, what would you say is your favorite kit setup? Do you have a personal thing that you... Yeah, I mean... Like, I'll, if you see a certain set kit set up a certain way, are you ever like, I'm not playing that at ab- all? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, because a lot of times, I like I just said, like, on this M83, th- uh, the Miley thing, on the M83 thing, like, a lot of times I'm filling in for, be- for people. So yeah. not only do I have to play their kit, I have to play it the way it's set up, mm-hmm. you know, just to make everybody's life easier, the tech. And I don't have to do that, but if I can manage and it's not, like, really making me uncomfortable, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll do it. Nah, man, I have to play whatever's there. You know, I mean, obviously I'm playing my own companies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to play a DW kit and Sabian cymbals and Remo heads and Vic Firth sticks, okay. no matter what I'm doing um, for live stuff. If I'm on a recording session, that's all totally up in the air. I mean, mm-hmm. it totally depends. I mean, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine kits and... 11 bass drums in my living room. <laughs> That's just in the living That's room. That's just in the, this is my studio. Um, so it totally depends on what I'm doing. Um, but as far as my actual setup goes, I generally like having two rack toms, two floor toms, kick and snare. I, l- I like having that extra rack tom um, as a transitory thing so I can get from my... Because ten- you're lazy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly because I hate reaching from my first rack tom to my first floor tom. Like, I hate doing that. Like, it's really yeah. uncomfortable for me. So it's a lot easier to do that. And I also like having two floor toms so I can just lay into both of them. Yeah. You know? So I like having the two and the two. Okay. Um, it, that's generally what I try to, you know, I usually play 10, 12, 16, 18, 22. When I did Mars Volta, I did 12, 13, 16, 18, 24. You know, when I did Miley, it was 12, 18, 24. Now, but when you walk, you said that they have the kits set up for you, right? Right. In the Miley thing. Right. That means that you don't bring your DW? No, because luckily Stacy already plays DW. Okay. So, but, uh, so you don't have any control over the symbols? Well, I Maybe know, you can adjust the placement. He, luckily, we play all the same companies except for symbols. Mm-hmm. So I bring, he plays Pisces, so I bring in my Sabians. Okay. Uh, and that's the only change that I made. Like snare drum sizes and everything is already predetermined. Yep. Who determines that stuff? Him? He does, and it's it's kind of a give and take between him and the front of house dude. Oh. Yeah, because wow. he, you okay. know, what might sound good acoustically or in your ears is not what it sounds like all the way across yeah. an arena. So, so the actual front of house guy might well, Paul be ha- involved in Paul Hager, we need to who, use a different snare. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Paul Hager, who's doing front of house for them, is a genius. Um, and he's worked with a lot of people and he's really well respected and he really knows what he's doing. Um, so, you know, if, if he told me to 
if like we were like I brought in a Craviato, a '97 DW Craviato snare, mm-hmm. just because I just got it, and I was like, oh, this will be cool. Like Stacey will geek out on this, and we were using a DW brass drum, and there was also a steel one there, and uh, and we were kind of going between all three of them, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh yeah, this sounds great, and then you know we go back to the brass and, and Hager, you know, Paul's like, yeah, that, that drum sounds the best. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, even though I might've liked the Craviato better, yeah. like I'm trusting him that, that what he's hearing is not what I'm hearing. So just like when you're doing a recording session and the, and the producers like, or the engineers like, nope. Like when I was doing this record with killer be killed, you know, with Josh mm-hmm. Wilbur, who did the last Gojira and the last lamb of God and my old band, the engineered, my drums on the Daughters of Mara record and I really trust him and he knows what he's doing and I brought you know I have like 60 snare drums so I brought like 10 really incredible snare drums and so I have this sonar signature drum that's like in cast bronze it's like 35 pounds it's really awesome one of my favorite drums I own and uh, and I had all these Keplingers and a Tama Bell brass which is like a legendary drum and all these drums and I kept being like okay man let's use this one on this track and he's just like nope <laughs> he's like that sonar just beats everything dude he's like stop like stop like stop wasting my time like that's the drum and mm. i'm like you sure like what about this and i put this he's like nope what about this nope wow. and i'm like okay even though i'm the artist and i'm and he's working for me technically he's you know i'm paying him for his opinion and so i'm just like okay we'll just stick with this yeah and and it sounds great because that's another thing. Like recording sessions are a whole other deal. Like you can, he- like microphones pick up all kinds of shit that you're not hearing. Uh, so like you can have a drum in the room and you're like, "Fuck, this sounds good." And you go in the recording in, in the control booth and you're like, "Ooh." That's or- what uh, Simon Phillips was saying. Absolutely. A lot of those old kits, they sound great because they're crap. Yep. And they happen just- to fit with the mics and they happen to sit yep. in the mix. They're just dead. Way. They're just dead, and, you're, and you don't have to put tape all over them because they're naturally <laughs> just like. Pfft. <laughs> there's a lot of times when you're like, God, like I remember when I first started doing recording sessions and, and, uh, or just sitting in on them and watching and, and just be like, man, those snares are so loose and this drum's so dead and it's just, ugh. Yeah. And then I go into the, you know, control room and I'd be like, oh, that's the same drum. Like, yeah. what? You know? And that was a huge learning experience for me, you know? So I could get into how it's like that with video too. Absolutely. So I got lucky, and also with M83, like, w- me and Loic played the same, all the same stuff except for cymbals. Hmm. So it was just super convenient. And you don't have any hang-ups about that, it sounds like. You just let go of it. You just come in and... I don't care. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, if, like, the, he was playing a different brand drums, I'd be like, I have to get a DW kit in here. Yeah. And if they were like, that's impossible, like, go fuck yourself, <laughs> I'd be like, okay, well, I guess I'm just putting duct tape over this bass drum head. Yeah, you got to be realistic, you know. People that come in and make demands, especially when you're coming in as like the new guy, mm-hmm. you can't come in and like make all these demands, regardless of whether they're warranted or not. You know, you just got to be easygoing and just being like, sure, this is whatever. Do you do you see a correlation between people who make demands and are picky like that, and how successful they are? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, man. Yeah, no one wants to have a pain in the ass around, you know. Yeah. Or you have to be like incredibly like unbelievable, like yeah, like you have to make up for it in some other way. Like, well, Stevie Wonder's asking for it, so we're gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, if you're a total fucking pain in the ass, like you have to either you have to like get your work. Oh, I see what you, you mean. You have to like get your work done, like, and do a whole record in like two hours. Yeah. With minimal editing needed. Yeah, so you like, have to you have to make up for it in, in some being other area. Unbelievable. Yeah, in some other area. Okay. Like that's ma- that's you know m- making people put up with you. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So you know you don't want to make make everybody. You just want to. If you're coming in on a gig, especially filling in, which is what I've done on pretty much every gig I've had. I'm filling in. I'm helping them out. I'm making mm-hmm. sure they can do this tour. Um, whatever you just want to make everybody's life as easy as possible mm-hmm. you don't want to come in and just be a wear out yeah you know, people just be like oh I can't wait until this guy's gone you yeah. know what I mean like you just want to make everybody like you know I mean I actually like try to have people not even know I'm there <laughs> playing wise yeah you know I mean I guess personally so you don't come out too. and just start banging on things <laughs> no. and checking your uh, no dude I hate that shit warming up a little <laughs> bit no, I hate that 
They hate it when drummers do that or anybody, guitar players. Like, yeah. it's yeah. like, shut up. Like, just yeah. shut up until you're supposed to play the song. Yeah. Drives me crazy. But like, no, like, just the way I'm playing, I just try to mimic the person's parts exactly so, like, they don't even know that it's a different person, which is what Paul Hager said. He was like, when we were rehearsing, he's like, you can't even tell. I mean, there's, like, subtleties, obviously, but, like, you can't even really tell it's a different person. And that's what I want. I want everybody to just just be comfortable. Not that I, like, don't want to have an identity, obviously, but, again, like, you have to look at each situation for what it is. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to put my stamp on Miley's music. That's yeah. not what they're it's not what they're calling me for. Yeah. They're calling me to, like, show up on time, do my homework, and get this fucking show done and have it be good. You there know? was this quote this morning that I saw on Facebook of... Uh I don't remember who it was. I don't know if you saw what I posted, but it was somebody who said, who cares about money? A man is someone who does what they want, what they want to do all day long or something. Uh, and I thought, no, it sounds more like a child to me. Uh huh. It sounds like what you're talking about is actually a mature situation where, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, you know, if you want to be like some destitute, like starving artist, undiscovered genius, yeah. Like because you're playing your own stuff and anything else is like selling out. Like, yeah, yeah. Great, go for it. I don't want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> you're more than welcome to do that. I just don't want to hear you complain about it. So, last question: Do you see yourself continuing on this uh, on this path? I mean, you're doing uh, some gigs, yeah. uh, session work, live mm -hmm. touring, mm -hmm. but you're also doing your more. Original stuff on the mm -hmm. side, right? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Well, that's going to turn... You like doing a, a combination of things? Sure. Or is, or well, that's the only one? way you can make a living these days. Okay. You have to be... I mean, luckily, I love teaching, and I've been doing it for a long time. So, you know, I teach a lot, both... And in, you're a very good teacher, I oh, have to say. Thank I you. Have, <laughs> I have many hours of you uh, <laughs> instructing. That's and, true. And uh, well, really thank really good you. at it. Thank you. Um, so I take that very, very seriously, and I put a lot of time and thought and energy into that. So I, I also like how you don't take any shit <laughs> when you're teaching. You're like, when I'm talking, I don't want to hear any sticks tapping. I don't want to hear anything. Yeah, because I stop. Yeah, because that means I'm going to get pissed off. Yeah, because that means people aren't fucking listening. Yeah, and drummers love to fucking noodle and diddle and do all yeah, this yeah. shit. And if they're just like, they might be looking at me, but there's yeah. nothing behind their eyes because they're like <laughs> doing double strokes or something, you know. And it's like, <laughs> if I'm talking to you, there's a reason why I'm talking to you. Yeah, I don't just talk to hear myself, hear my own voice. Yeah, like if I'm telling you something, I'm trying to help you out. So mm -hmm. shut the fuck up. It's also a matter of respect. You know, like if I'm taking a lesson with someone, which I still do sometimes, I would never fucking do that when someone's talking. Like yeah. I'm paying this person good money. <laughs> yeah. Like I want to hear everything they have to say, you know, yeah. and also it's respect, you know. Anyway, so, you know, I teach a bunch both in person and I do, I've been doing a lot of Skype lessons lately, which is great mm -hmm. um, from everybody all over the world, um, which is fun. And then, you know, recording sessions here and there when they pop up. Um, then touring when that happens and, and, you know, just kind of a little bit of everything, you know, which is what you have to do these days, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what else am I going to do? I don't know. I don't have really any other interests. You know, there's nothing like, I'm not like, well, maybe I'll, you know, just be a real estate agent or something. <laughs> like I have no desire to really do anything else. Yeah. So I'm going to do this as long as I can. And if it doesn't, uh, at some point I can't living keep living the same life, lifestyle i'm accustomed to living but know. i mean you don't see yourself going into being like a producer at some point no. or a musical director no. or whatever i wish i could be but i don't have the musical knowledge like i don't play any other instruments hmm. so i don't have that that other side that's really necessary to do that and there are producers and maybe even musical directors but there are producers who are like that like G -G -G garth who did my old band's record like he doesn't play any instruments you know, mm -hmm. but he's produced a bunch of huge records like, you know, Rick, Rick Rubin he doesn't play any instruments. And there are some mm. people like that. I don't know. I don't know how they do that, but they do. Yeah. And it like works for them. Like Terry, oh. Terry date, you know, he's another dude. Like, oh, I didn't know that. And sometimes it just works for them. But I'm not one of those dudes. I would I would need to get at least somehow semi proficient at playing piano or something so I could be like, oh, hey, you know, you need to resolve this over here or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be one of those drummers who's like, yeah, I'm a producer now. And it's like, no, you're not. Like, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, you know. Maybe in 20 years or something, but who knows if producers are even going to be around in 20 <laughs> years, you know. But 
Well, when they just start plugging a cable into <laughs> somebody's head and then it goes into someone else, or wireless. <laughs> just a bunch yeah. of people all sitting around staring at each other. Yeah, it'll be like Demolition Man. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, but yeah, man, I'm just going to keep, keep plugging away, you know? Cool. Yeah. And people can look at your website, DaveElich.com. Yeah, uh, or my Facebook music page, or my Twitter, or my Instagram. It's all... As Dr. Zoltan would say, <laughs> if you cannot find Dave Elich on the internet, you are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not me. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all there for the taking. Cool. Anything else you want to throw in there? Well, thanks for, thanks for having me. It's been fun, as usual. All right. Thank you. Bye. To listen to the audio version of this podcast and other exclusive meta.com data, please visit click.com to duckinalightbulb.com. Also try our sister website, now available in English language versions, to buy Carl King's book, So You're a Creative Genius. Now what? Open mwp.com in practically any web browser. Now available on the web.